description bismillah na'udhu billahi min shaitanir rajim allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana tayyib let's start again inshallah bismillah so the first situation is when the enemy is in the direction of the qibla the imam he has uh, the the contingent divided into two groups group a and group b so both of them they are going to be facing the imam with the imam praying with the imam when the imam he finishes uh, the ruku of the first raka group a which is directly behind the imam they go into the sujood with the imam whereas group b which are behind the uh, which are in the second row we can say they stand up and they remain facing the enemy okay um when the imam he's making sujood with group a then uh, group B stands is, is standing up remaining standing up once the uh, Imam has got up with group A for the second raka, then group B they go into the sujood and they make their sujood when they finish their sujood they get up and they swap places with group A so group B which was behind uh, the Imam and the first line of soldiers they now swap with the first line okay they go into the position of group A and then what happens the imam he prays with them the second rakah they all make ruku together and then the line which is closest to them which is now group, group b closest to the imam they make sujood with the imam but group the second group which was group a after they had changed they don't make sujood with the imam they uh, remain waiting until the imam and the first group has made sujood when sujood is made by the imam and the group which is closest to him then the group which is behind, they then make sujood and then they all, both groups, they finish the tashahud and the taslim with the imam. This is the first description, right? Another description is if the enemy is not in the direction of the qibla, the enemy can be any direction. <clears throat> so what the imam he does, again, he divides them into two groups. So one group he will pray with and the other group will be standing facing the direction of the qibla. So the Imam, he prays with the first group, one raka, complete raka. He stands up and he waits for the group that is praying with him to finish their second raka by themselves to make the shahud and make the slim. Now this group goes and then takes the place of the group that are facing the enemy, protecting the contingent. The second group now comes and joins the Imam and they pray with the Imam, uh, the second raka of the Imam, but for them it's going to be the first raka. And so when the Imam, he's prayed the second raka, he waits in the tashahud position and this group B, the second group, they pray the second raka for themselves and then they join the Imam in tashahud and both the Imam and this group, they make uh, taslim together. So in this situation, the second situation, uh, one group has prayed the first raka with the Imam, then they completed the second raka for themselves and they went and took over from where the other group was facing the enemy and the Imam was waiting in the standing position. He was waiting in the standing position in the sec second raka. So the second group they came and they prayed the second raka with the Imam but for them it was the first raka. The Imam he remained standing and uh, uh, waiting for them. Once he prays a raka with them he goes into tashahud. Uh, the second group, they get up and they make the second raka for themselves and then they rejoin the Imam in tashahud and both the Imam and the second group, they make the tashahud and taslim with the Imam. This is the sifa chosen by Imam Ahmed in Imam Shafi'i. One of the reasons Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he chose this sifa was because this is in accordance with the ayah that we recited first from Surah An nisa and it's also uh, narrated authentically by Ibn Abi uh, Hathma in Bukhari and Muslim. So this was the sifa that Imam Ahmad chose and as Shaykh Fahad al-Mutiri mentioned that there has to be at least three people in each group for this uh, to take place, for them to be divided into two groups. طيب. These are the two main descriptions that I mentioned. There are other descriptions. One of them is that the Imam, he prays with both groups uh, one raka, okay? He prays with both groups one raka, and each of them they finish off the second raka by themselves, and this is done, uh, of course, uh, by themselves. Another description 
is that the Imam, he prays with both groups two raka. So he prays with group A two raka, then they make taslim and they go off. And the other group comes and they pray two raka with the Imam and they make taslim with the Imam. So what ends up happening as a conclusion is that the Imam, he prays four raka, but with one taslim. Okay, so he ends up praying with both groups two raka. And for the Imam, it's four raka with one taslim. And like we said, there's all together around six or seven descriptions. I'm not going to mention them all. But the one that we mentioned of Abi Hathma, uh, that was the one which was uh, chosen by Imam Ahmad and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The author, he says, وَيُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ يَحْمِلَ مَعْهُ فِي صَلَاتِهَا مِنَ السِّلَاءِ مَا يَدْفَعُهُ بِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَلَا يُسْقِلُهُ كَسَيْفٍ وَنَحْوِهِ It's recommended for the people, the soldiers, that when they are praying, they carry with them uh, weaponry which is light and it doesn't uh, occupy them from the actions of the Salah uh, in order to defend themselves. So it's recommended that when they are praying they should carry some light type of weaponry which they could use if a need arises and it wouldn't be heavy and complex to the extent that it's going to uh, keep them busy from the prayer. Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman and Nahabi he mentions some interesting masail pertaining to this uh, very short section. He says, if the people have prayed Salat al-Khawf, thinking that the enemy or the danger is close to them. But after the Salat, they come to realize that actually the danger is not as close as we thought, meaning the enemy is not in the vicinity as of yet. Then what they have to do, they have to repeat the Salat in the complete uh, mode, not missing out anything and not changing anything from the Salat. So they could still pray it as two raka'ah if they were travelers, but what they have to do, they have to repeat the Salat and do it in the mode that they normally would do if the enemy was not in the vicinity. And also another thing that is mentioned by the Sheikh, he said that some of the Hanbali scholars like Sheikh uh, Ibn Uthaymin and Ibn Ibaz rahimahullah ta'ala, they said that it's the fear is so severe at the time of praying Salat al-Khawf that the person is unable to think about what he is doing, he's unable to concentrate because you can imagine in a state of war, the situation can get very difficult, complex, and the person is unable to concentrate. So in this situation, the Mujahideen, they can delay the Salah until a time when the fear has decreased and they are able to concentrate on the prayer that they are doing. And also this may be in a situation where the soldiers are likely to um, open up a fort, victory is about to be given. And if they were to uh, turn away from, you know, uh, engaging the enemy with full force, then maybe they would lose that victory. So in this situation, they can also delay the Salah and then they can return to the Salah once the victory has been achieved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next uh, important chapter that the author, rahimullah ta'ala, that he speaks about, he says, Bab Salat al Jum'ah, the chapter pertaining to the issues of Jum'ah. And Jum'ah, linguistically, it can be said with a Dhamma on the meme, Jum'ah, or it can be said with a Sukun on the meme, Jum'ah, or it can be said with a fatha on the meme. Okay, Jum'ah, like this Jum'ah type. So it can be said with a Dhamma on the meme, it can be said with a Sukun, it can be said with a fatha. Uh, prior to Islam, it used to have the name as Yawmul Aruba. It used to be known as Yawmul Aruba amongst the Arabs. Uh, it was in the Prophet Sallallahu time that it was turned and changed to Yawmul Jum'ah. So this Yawmul Jum'ah, it's a famous name for us. It's a famous, uh, very extremely important act of worship. A question to yourselves, why do you think it might be called Yawmul Jum'ah? Do you know of any reason why it be, might be called Yawmul Jum'ah? Tayyib, barakallahu feek. So that is one of the reasons that the ulama, they said, because an-nas yajtami'una fihi li salah, that the people, they come together and they congregate together in a jama'ah, in a congregation, to pray Salatul Jum'ah. And this was mentioned by um, Ibn Hazm, Rahimullah Ta'ala. This was his opinion. Another opinion is that because Lian Adam wa Hawa ijtama'a fi yawmil Jum'ah. The Adam and Hawa, alayhi salam, they gathered, they came together on the earth after having been separated and sent down separate. They came together on the earth and found one another. Okay, so the coming together is the meaning which is common uh, in all explanations. And this was mentioned by Ibn Hajr al Askalani. Rahimullah Ta'ala. Another meaning is that uh, Kaab ibn Lu'ay, uh, prior to Islam, he used to be a chieftain, well respected. He would gather the people uh, from amongst the tribes of the Quraysh, etc. And he would remind them about the importance of uh, taking care of the Kaaba in the vicinity of the Haram. 
and he would also remind them that there was a prophet which is soon going to be sent. And the fourth reason given by many of the scholars is that Adam that on this day the creation of Adam from the various parts of the earth were brought together and Adam السلام, he was created. And this uh, is an ather, there's an ather, there's a narration pertaining to Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu on this topic. In any case, all of them they have to do with the gathering of people uh, on this day and for us Salatul Jummah when the community comes together to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it has the meaning of gathering okay so it's directives are found in the Quran and the Sunnah in the Quran for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in Surah Al-Jummah Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu idha nudiya lis-salati min yawm al-jum'ati fas'au ila dhikrillah or you who believe if the call is given for the Salatul Jummah then rush to it and do not delay and also in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Ibn Masudin radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الجمعتي, He said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pertaining to a group of people that would uh, remain away from Jummah. He said, لَقَدْ حَمَّمْتُ أَنْ آمُرَ الرَّجُلًا فَيُصَلِّ بِالنَّاسِ He said, verily, I had a strong intention to command a person from amongst the Muslims who would pray with the people. ثُمَّ أَحَرِّقَ then I wanted to set fire the houses of a group of men that would stay away from Juma. So this shows you that Salat al Juma is uh, you know, something obligatory and commanded by the Prophet because he would not want to punish a people for not attending it if it had not been obligatory. From the virtues of Salat al Jummah, and there are many, but we'll take one hadith. Uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he mentions as in Sahih Muslim, خَيْرُ يَوْمٍ طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ شَمْسِ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ فِيهِ خُلِقَ عَادَمْ وَفِيهِ أُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَفِيهِ أُخْرِجَ مِنْهَا وَلَا تَكُمْ مُسَاعَةُ إِلَّا فِي يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that um, the best day that the sun has ever risen upon is the day of Juma. The best day that the sun rises upon is the day of Juma. In it, Adam Islam was created. In it, he was entered into Jannah, and in it, he was removed from Jannah. And uh, the hour will not be established except on the day of Juma. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, is going to now talk about Shurut al Wajub, the conditions pertaining to uh, who it's obligatory upon. Okay, if these uh, matters and descriptions are found, then it's obligatory upon these people. So he says, It's obligatory upon every male who is free and who is mukallaf and who is a Muslim. So we find in the hadith of Tariq ibn Shihab in Abi Dawood, the Prophet وسلم, said, Al Jum'atu haqqun wajib ala kulli Muslimin fi jama'atin illa arba'a. The Prophet sallallahu said in the, in the hadith in Muslim in Abi Dawood of Tariq ibn Shihab that Juma is an obligation upon every Muslim <coughs> excuse me in Juma except upon four. He said Abdul Mamluk except upon the slave or Imra'atun or upon the woman or Sabiyun or upon the young child or a Marid or upon a sick person. Okay so the Prophet sallallahu is establishing here that Juma is obligatory upon every person except for these. And the author he mentioned it's obligatory of course upon uh, one who is a male and the hadith clearly mentioned that women it's not obligatory upon them. And the author he mentioned upon a hur, the one who is free and the hadith clearly mentioned that it's not obligatory upon one who is uh, in servitude, who is a slave. And it's also obligatory upon the mukallaf. The mukallaf is the one who is aqil and baligh, the one who has his faculties of uh, intellect about him, <clears throat> and the one who is baligh, the one who has reached the age, we can say, the age of 15 or the age of puberty. Okay? However, even if a child has not reached, a male child has not reached the age of uh, taklif, the age of being baligh, then it's upon the parents that they instruct the child that he should go to Salatul Jummah and he should learn about the, the rights and the practices of Salatul Jummah. <clears throat> we mentioned that it's obligatory only upon a Muslim. Now, uh, the Khitab al Wujub, the address of it being obligatory, is also in a way upon the Kufar. Okay? 
they are مخاطب with تخليف they are addressed with تكليف okay however this تخليف is that first they have to become Muslims but they are still taken into account for not performing the acts of worship which they should perform once they have become Muslim okay because in the Quran when it says ما سلككم في سقر قالوا لم نكن من المصلين ولم نكن نطعم المسكين وكنا نخذ ما أخائدين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين okay this verse and others uh, some of the ulama they say that the it proves that the non-muslims are still going to be held accountable for the acts of worship that they left off okay so even though they're not um, addressed as being muslims they're still going to be taken into account for leaving off the act uh, of worship and this is going to be a punishment for them in any case uh, just as a quick summary the author he said it's obligatory upon everybody who is a uh, male and who's mukallaf okay reaches the age of puberty and is free okay if the person is free he's not enslaved then of course it's obligatory upon them another condition to know if it's obligatory on a person or not is that the author he says mustawtinin bibina in that the person has to be a resident in a permanent structure so he's a permanent resident in a land in the sense that he doesn't travel yearly or travel uh, often from that land that land is taken for him as a permanent residence and he's got a uh, a place that he lives in which is not made of straw it's not a tent it's a permanent structure okay this is what it means by mustawtinin bibna and um, so this excludes two types of people the first of them is the traveler that is allowed to shorten so the traveler that is allowed to shorten juma is not obligatory upon that person just as a quick recap what are the three conditions for um, a traveler to be able to shorten the salah from the previous lessons that we took? What are the three conditions for a traveler to be able to shorten the salah? Taib, the three conditions that we mentioned was that the journey has to be 80 kilometers or more and the travel itself has to be mubah, meaning that the reason for the travel has to be permissible and that the person who is traveling, the traveler, doesn't intend to be muqim, doesn't intend to reside in the destination for more than four days so if these conditions are there then the journey the traveler he can shorten so the one who is mustawtin bibana of course this excludes as we said the traveler uh, who is going to make qasr okay and the traveler is going to make qasr is the one who uh, fulfills the three conditions that we just mentioned and also it excludes as a second person obviously the one who is non-mustawtin the one who is non-mustawtin are the ones who are non-resident in the sense that they uh, live in that land but they always move to different parts of the country okay so they live in the vicinity they have a residence there of a tent or something of that nature but it's a type of structure that they can pack up very easily and they're always moving so it's referring to the Bedouin, the Bedouins that would be found in the time of the Prophet ﷺ on the outskirts of Medina because it was never reported that the Prophet ﷺ ever ordered the Bedouins on the outskirts of Medina to pray Salatul Jum'ah with the residents of Jum'ah. So the traveler who can shorten and also the Bedouins who are continually moving every few months or every six months or so, they are also exempt from Salatul Jum'ah. So the Mustawtin, as I mentioned, is somebody who takes a permanent residence in the land and he's in a permanent structure. Ibn Taymiyyah ta from amongst the Hanbalis, he said that it's not a consideration that the, uh, that the structure has to be permanent. Rather, what's permanent is the fact that they are residents in that land. So the structure itself doesn't have to be a permanent structure. It can be that they still live in tents. However, they are not under the description of being like Bedouins. <clears throat> the author, he says, اسمه واحد ولو تفرقا that the name of this residency which is permanent it has one name what he means here is that uh, the place where the people are living whom Juma is obligatory upon okay the name is one name that they share so the, there has to be at least 40 people that are living under the same name so say for example there is a city and it ha just call it Riyadh, Riyadh like in Saudi Arabia there has to be at least 40 people living in that city or that town or a village that share the same name okay even if the houses tafarruq even if the houses are separated and scattered throughout that uh, vicinity throughout the city throughout the village that doesn't matter 
but what matters is that the uh, the place is sh shares one name. The author he says, "ليس بينه وبين المسجد أكثر من فرسخ أكثر من فرسخ." That there shouldn't be between the person who is obligatory upon and between the masjid more than the distance of a farsakh. And as we said, a farsakh is around three miles distance in journey, in walking. So what the author is mentioning here, he's mentioning that it's obligatory upon people uh, pertaining to the distance. And this has two considerations, two points that we need to mention. The first of them is that if somebody is within the ballot, they're within the city or they're within the town or the village. Now, this city, town or village can be a huge uh, village, town and city, right? So between the person and the masjid, they may be up to 10 kilometers or maybe 15 kilometers. But that is not a consideration, meaning to say that no matter how far the person is from the masjid where the Juma is going to be established, as long as they are in, within the confines of the city or the town or the village, then Juma is obligatory upon that person, right? Wherever what the author was specifically speaking about was saying that if a person is outside the city or the town or the village, he lives outside the border of the town, city or village, then if between this person and the closest masjid within the village, town or city is a farsakh, is three miles or more, then it's not obligatory upon this person. However, it, if it is less than three miles, if it is three miles or less, then it is obligatory upon the person. So if a person lives on the outskirts of a city or a village or a town, and between him and the closest masjid in that town, city or village is three miles or less, then it's obligatory upon that person to attend that masjid and to pray Jummah there. And the dadil for the tahdid bil farsakh, the evidence for the establishing the distance of being one farsakh as being that which is obligatory, is taken from the same verse which shows that Juma is obligatory. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, إِذَا نُودِيَ لِصْوَلَاتِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Oh, you who believe, if the call is given to the Salat al Juma on the day of Juma, then race to performing Juma. So the, author, the ulama, they say that the call to prayer on a normal day, which is not windy, and you don't have a lot of noise, it's a silent day, the wind will carry the uh, call to prayer from a, a normal person, for the distance of three farsakh at least. Okay, so this is the minimum distance that the call of prayer would be carried. So a person uh, of, of a farsakh, sorry, not three farsakh, of a farsakh, which is three miles, uh, would be able to hear the call to prayer on a quiet day from a mu'adhin who is making the adhan. So they say, based upon this, if the person is within the vicinity of a farsakh, okay, but he's outside of the uh, city limits or the village or town limits, then that person has to respond. And however, I said that if the person is within the city limits or within the town limits or within the village limits, then no matter how far they are from the masjid, they have to respond. The author says, وَلَا تَجِبُوا عَلَى مُسَافِرٍ سَفَرَ قَصَرٍ And we mentioned this already, that it's not obligatory upon the, word, upon the person, the musafir, who is doing a travel, a journey, wherein he is allowed to make qasr, where he is allowed to shorten. Meaning that the journey is 80 kilometers or more, the journey is a permissible journey, it's mubah, and the person is not going to stay at, at the residence for more than four days. Uh, the reason they say this is because uh, they said that it's not found in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that he وسلم, would shorten whilst he was on a journey, nor is it found in the Sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin, the rightly guided Caliphs, that they shortened on their journeys. Okay, what about those who are nazil fi safrihim? Those who are, uh, yani those who are taking a break in their journey. So they've arrived at a town or a village, and <clears throat> they are taking a break from their journey, and the Juma is going to be established in that town or village. Do they have to attend the Juma? So the traveller who's taking a break in a town or village, do they have to attend the Juma because they are travellers? Question to yourselves. Would it depend if it's uh, less than four days? 
Yeah, so if they're going to stay in that place for more than four days, this is a consideration. But in any case, the majority of the ulama, including the Hanbalis, they say that it's not obligatory upon the person that they has to attend Jummah, even if he is nazil fi safrihi, even if he is one who's only taken a break from his journey. Okay, he's still on his journey, he hasn't reached his destination, but he's at a town or a village just to take a break. So this is known as nazil fi safrihi, that the person uh, in this situation, he doesn't have to respond to the whole of Jummah. However, Ibn Taymiyyah was from amongst the humble scholars that said, yes, he has to respond to uh, the call to prayer, I mean the call for Salat al uh, because this is a general call and only those that the text explicitly exempt are those people that are exempted. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala is saying. Okay, so according to the majority, they don't have to, but according to Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala, they have to, because he says that the verses pertaining to Jummah <coughs> and the ahadith pertaining to Jummah are general, and the only exceptions are going to be made for those whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explicitly exempted, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So the author, he also says, uh, people that are exempted, he says, wala abdin, wala imra'atin. Also exempt, or also Jummah is not obligatory upon, is the abd, the slave, or the imra'a, or the woman. So upon the slave and the woman, it's not uh, obligatory. And the author also mentioned prior to those two, the traveler, okay, so these three people, uh, Jummah is not obligatory upon them. The traveler, the slave, or the woman. And also we said that the one who lives further than a farsakh outside uh, the borders of the town or city okay so the person that is outside the borders of the town or city or the village if he's further than a farsakh from the nearest masjid then that person Juma is not obligatory upon that person also the author he says وَمَنْ حَدَرَهَا مِنْهُمْ أَجْزَأَتْهُ whoever from amongst these people that Juma is not obligatory upon them right like the musafir or the woman or the slave if any of these do attend the Jummah, then their Jummah is valid, okay? So though it's not obligatory upon them, but if they do attend the Salatul Jummah for whatever reason, then the Salatul Jummah for them will be valid. And this is Ijma' by Ibn Mundir and others. They said the illa, the reason is because annaha saqatat anhum taqfifa min al-shari'a fa idha hadaruha sahat. That these people, the Sharia gave them taqfif, gave them ease. So they didn't have to attend. However, if they attended of their own volition, they attended of their own choice, then they would be uh, accepted from them and they would be rewarded for it. The author, he says, bihi. However, these people, the traveler, uh, for example, the slave and the woman, they are not going to be considered. Bihi. They are not going to be considered as the uh, required number for Salat al-Jumma. So let's take the opinion of the Hanbalis, for example, that Salat al-Jumma requires 40 people who fit the category, who fit the description of Jumma having to be obligatory upon them, right? So if you have um, a group of them that are attending and they are from the women and they are from the slaves and they are from the travelers, okay, um, then they are not going to be counted amongst the number required, which is 40, for Jumma to be established, okay? These are not going to be counted. Why? Why would they not be counted and considered as being from amongst the num number, which is 40, for Jummah to be established? Why do you think that they wouldn't be considered in this consideration of the number of 40? Ahsant barakallah feek. May Allah give you good because it's not obligatory upon them. Okay? So it has to be 40 people that Jummah is obligatory upon. However, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Yan'aqid bihim. He says, it is established, meaning to say that they are considered amongst the 40. Okay, so the Madhab says no, but Ibn Taymiyyah from the Mujtahid Imams of the Madhab, he says, yes, it is as a second opinion. It is established. They are considered from amongst the number. The author, he says, Walam yasiha an ya umma fiha. So these people that are exempt from Jummah, it's, if they attend, uh, we said that their attending is valid for them, but they are not considered to be amongst the number 40. They're not going to be, to be counted amongst the minimum number of 40 for which 40 is required for Jummah to be established. 
And also they are not going to be considered to be valid as being Imams. Okay, so the slave, if he attends the Jummah, according to this opinion, he cannot be the Imam. And also the traveler, if he attends the Jummah, he cannot be the Imam. And this is, you know, if you hold this opinion, you can think about, for example, if you have a famous scholar coming to visit you and he's going to be with you for less than four days. Okay, then this scholar is not able to lead your community in the Salah according to this opinion. Why is this the case? He says because their Juma is valid for them only if there are 40 people whom it's obligatory upon. So, so their Juma, these whom are exempt, meaning the slave, the woman, and the traveler, these, their Juma is only valid for them as long as there are a group of people, uh, 40 or more, that Juma is obligatory upon them. So their Juma, the ones who attend from amongst the women, the slave and the traveller, their Juma is only going to be valid if, you f if they find 40 upon whom uh, Juma is obligatory. So it cannot be the case that these three can lead those uh, others in Salah. Why? Because these three, their Juma is only valid by the presence of the 40 and therefore they these three cannot lead uh, those whom they need to make their juma valid in the salah i hope that's clear inshallah inna masahat minhum taba'an li ghayrihim their juma is only valid because they are following uh, those or they are part, they are now uh, with the group who juma is obligatory upon right so if that group wasn't there of the 40 that uh, uh, Juma is obligatory upon them, then these three who were excused, their Salah wouldn't be valid. Uh, Salatul Juma wouldn't be valid. So therefore they cannot lead them in the Salah. The author he says, وَمَنْ سَقَطَتْ عَنْهُ لِعُذْرٍ وَجَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ وَنْعَقَدَتْ بِهِ And whoever Juma is removed from due to an excuse. So he's not talking now about the traveller or the woman or the slave, okay? He's talking about somebody who has an excuse not to attend Salatul Jummah. And we said, if you remember, that everybody who is excused from Salatul Jummah, then this person is also excused uh, from Salatul Jummah. Okay? وَمَنْ سَقَطَتْ عَنْهُ لِعُذْرٍ وَجَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ وَنْعَقَدَتْ بِهِ So whoever is excused uh, from Salatul Jummah, let's say for example a person is sick and he cannot attend the Salatul Jummah. Now, if this person does happen to attend Salatul Jummah. It's difficult for him to attend, but for whatever reason he forces himself to attend Salatul Jummah, then this person's Jummah is going to be valid for him. It's going to be wajib upon him, in fact, that now that he's attended, it's obligatory upon him to remain and to finish the Salatul Jummah with the Imam, unless his sickness gets much worse to a very dangerous state, then in this situation he can leave. But otherwise it's going to become obligatory upon him because now he chose not to have the excuse of being excused from Salatul Jummah, which was that he was sick. He chose to attend, therefore it's wajib upon him. One aqadat bihi. And also he's going to be considered from the number 40 of those who it's obligatory upon. Why? Because it's originally obligatory upon him. Okay, but he had a mani'ah. He had an excuse, a prevention, which was that he was sick. So if he chose to attend, then it's the mania is lifted, the excuse is lifted, the udr is lifted, and he's considered as being one of those whom originally Juma was obligatory upon. Okay? So the difference between him and the musafir and the slave and the woman is that upon the musafir, the slave and the women, uh, Juma is not aslan obligatory upon them. Juma is not obligatory upon them. Whereas the sick person, Juma is aslan, is originally uh, obligatory upon him. However, he had an udr, he had an excuse. But he still came to the masjid, therefore his excuse was lifted. So now it's wajib upon him and also yan'aqid bihi. And also he's considered as being one of the 40 uh, required for Juma to be established. As mentioned by Sheikh Ba Jabir and others. Tayyib. Uh, and also he can be the Imam if they wanted him to be so this sick person. The author he says, وَمَنْ صَلَّى الظُّهْرِ مِمَّنْ عَلَيْهِ هُدُورُ الْجُمْعَةِ قَبْلَ صَلَاةِ الْإِمَامِ لَمْ تَصِحْ Whoever prays Salatul Jum'ah and it's obligatory upon him. It's obligatory upon a particular person to pray Salatul Jum'ah, right? To attend the Jum'ah. However, he doesn't, for whatever reason, 
and he prays uh, Salat al-Dhuhr in the house, then his Salat al-Dhuhr is not going to be accepted from him. Why is that the case? Question to yourselves. So there's a person, uh, Salat al-Jumma is obligatory upon him. He doesn't attend the Salat al-Jumma and instead prays Dhuhr. Okay? Before the Imam has prayed Salat al-Jumma, we're saying that this person, his Salat of Dhuhr is not going to be valid. Why do you think? Taib, the reason is because he's mukhatib with Salat al-Jumma. Okay? It's as though he prayed a prayer which he wasn't commanded to pray. He was commanded to pray Salat al-Jumma and he wasn't commanded to pray Salat al-Dhuhr. So by him praying whilst the Jumma is still taking place, he is going against that which he is commanded. Therefore, his Salat is not going to be valid. The author, he says, مِمَّنْ لَا تَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ However, if the person is one of those whom Jumma is not obligatory upon, like the traveller or the slave or the woman, then this person can pray uh, Salat al-Dhuhr even if the Imam hasn't finished praying Salat al-Jumma because it's not wajib upon these people. The author he says, well, hatta al-imam. However, it's better that they wait until the Imam prays. Okay, so the sick person or the slave, for example, uh, it's better that they pray uh, Dhuhr after the Imam has prayed Salat al-Jumma. Why do you think? Barakallah fiqh. Okay, so it's not, that is not the correct answer, but may Allah give you good for trying. Uh, so they're going to pray the Dhuhr at home. Okay, maybe this is a point I should have mentioned in the question. This is what the author is saying. They're praying their Jumma, their Dhuhr at home uh, because they're not attending Jumma. But what the scholars mean here, what the author he means here is that maybe, uh, you know, if they wait until the Imam has finished the Salat al Jumma, it may be the case that just five minutes before the Imam is about to finish the Jumma, okay, He's finishing the khutbah, for example, the sick person all of a sudden gets better. And if the sick person all of a sudden gets better, then now the Jumma is wajib upon him and he can reach the masjid and catch something from the Salat al Jumma. This is why they say it's better for them to wait until the Salat al Jumma is finished. Because until Jumma is finished, maybe something will happen to their situation whereby they can still attend the Jumma. The sick person may be cured, the slave, he may be given his freedom at that moment, so then Jumma will become obligatory upon them, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al-Mutiri and others. Type A mas'ala to mention uh, before we stop is that Imam Ahmed, he held that if the masjid is known to delay the Salatul Jumma uh, way beyond what it should be delayed, okay? And the person is unable to get to another masjid. That's the only masjid he has for whatever reason that he can get to. Maybe he doesn't have a car. Uh, and he knows that this masjid is going to delay it way beyond what is acceptably, not in terms of Sharia delay, but in acceptable in terms of customary norms. That it's going to make it very difficult upon me that if I wait for the Imam to establish the Jummah. In this situation, Imam Ahmed held that the person can pray Dhuhr. He doesn't have to attend the Jummah. Okay? This is based upon the hadith of Abu Dar in Sahih Muslim when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said كَيْفَ أَنْتَ إِذَا كَانَتْ عَلَيْكَ أُمَرَا يُؤَخِّرُونَ صَلَاءً وَقْتِهَا أَوْ يُمِيتُونَ صَلَاءً وَقْتِهَا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abu Dar رضي الله عنه How is your situation going to be if you have leaders among you that delay the salah beyond its time? Okay? Uh, Abu Dar رضي الله عنه He said مَا تَعْمُرُنِي يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ What do you order me with, O Prophet of Allah? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Salli as-salat li waqtiha. Pray the salah in its time. Uh, فَإِنْ أَدْرَكَتْهَا مَعْهُمْ فَصَلِّي فَإِنَّهَا لَكَنْ نَافِلَةً And then later on, if you catch the salah with them, meaning with the leaders, then pray with them also. And it will be for you a nafila. But the point from the hadith, the shahid or the wajhu dalala from the hadith, is that the Prophet Sallallahu is telling the person that if it's going to be delayed for you the salah from its time, then you should go ahead and pray. Okay, he's telling Abu Dar, go ahead and pray. And Imam Ahmed said from the hadith that if it's going to be delayed unjustly the Jummah, okay, which makes it very difficult upon the people, it's delayed uh, beyond the normal acceptable time, then the people or the person can pray Salat al-Dhuhr. The author, he says, وَلَا يَجُوزُ لِمَنْ تَلْزَمُهُ السَّفَرْ فِي يَوْمِهَا بَعْدَ الزَّوَالِ He mentions a very important point here, which is pertinent to many people. He said, it's not allowed if a person is from those whom Jummah is obligatory upon, it's not allowed for them to make a journey on the day of Jummah after the Zawal. Okay? 
after the time when the sun is in the <coughs> after the time of Zohar has come about because that now is the time when the Jummah is going to become obligatory on the, upon the person okay everybody agrees they have differences of opinions but they agree that this is a time where Jummah becomes obligatory upon the person to pray so the person is not allowed to take undertake a journey if Salatul Jummah is obligatory upon him after the time of Zawal because that is when the Adhan is going to be given for Salatul Jummah they say يُسْتَثْنَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْحُكَمْ مَسْأَلَةً Exempted from this ruling are two issues one is if that the person is going to miss their flight that they couldn't find a flight at any other time except for this time which is after Zawal okay if this person is kind of compelled he can't make the journey at another time he has to do it at this time then it's allowed for that person to miss the Jummah or any other situation like that um, the second istithna, the second exemption that the ulama they mention is if that a person knows that the call to Jummah is going to be given and he's going to travel however he knows that on his travel very soon he'll come to a stop and the people will be praying Jummah there and he will be able to catch the Jummah with them if he knows that's going to be the situation or for example he knows that once he gets to the airport there's going to be Salatul Jummah at the airport right maybe there's a group of travelers that he's going to meet they're all going to meet at the same time at the airport and uh, then they can pray Salatul Jummah there okay but this again depends upon the opinion uh, can travelers pray, pray Salatul Jummah or not the Madhab said that the travelers uh, they're not to be accounted amongst the number of 40 let's say for example there are other than travelers there the workers who are resident there's going to be at least 40 workers there and Juma is going to be established then in this situation then the person can leave and he can go on his travel because he knows when he gets to the airport he can pray Salatul Juma with those workers etc okay so these are the exceptions from the rule that the author mentioned that people are not allowed to travel after the Zawal after the time of Juma has come in if Juma is originally obligatory upon them so with regards to traveling before Zawal on Yawmul Jummah, the mashhur opinion in the Madhab is that it's allowed but it's makruh, this kiraha, okay, it's disliked. It's allowed but it's disliked, okay. Why is it disliked? Because though it hasn't become obligatory because it's not the time of Zawal, the person knows that he's going to miss Jummah and he's going to miss a huge amount of rewards. So it's something which is makruh, okay. And the evidence that allows the person to travel is found in the Musannaf of Ibn, of, um, Abd al-Zaq, the Musannaf of Abd al-Zaq and the Islam al-Sahih that Umar radiyallahu anhu he said inna al-Jum'a la tahbisu musafiran that Jum'a doesn't hold back a traveler فَخْرُجْ مَا لَمْ يَحِنَّ الْرَوَاحِ that go travel as long as the time the call to prayer is not going to be established so this means that the person before the time of Zawal if it's Yawm al-Jum'a and he needs to travel then he can do so but there's going to be kiraha is going to be disliked okay because of the rewards that he's going to miss by missing out Juma. question to yourselves when might it be haram for this person to travel before zawal not after zawal before zawal so a person we're saying that a person can travel okay but it's going to be makru however there may be a situation that before zawal for this particular person it's going to be haram for him to travel and the issue is pertaining to the issues that we have taken for Salatul Jummah. Any idea why? Why it might be haram for this person? Barakallah feek. Yeah, if he's not able to catch Jummah on his way somewhere, then yes, as we said, that is one of the exemptions, right? That the ulama mentioned. So that would mean if he's not able to do that, then he's not exempt from, from uh, the Jummah. So it would be haram for him. Yes, but that wasn't what I was thinking. Jazakallah khair. But that's the correct answer. So what, what I was referring to was that if this person, okay, sorry, no, what you've mentioned is uh, after. The ulama gave that as an exemption for uh, at the time of Zawal, once the Zawal has come in. They mentioned that as an exception, that a person can travel uh, if he knows that he's going to get the Jummah at the airport or in a town where he's going to stop off. Okay, that was the exemption that they gave for the person who travels at the time of Zawal. I'm saying... Uh, this, the last thing that the author said that if uh, the author didn't mention it sorry that if a person travels the madhab says 
that if a person travels before the zawal, then it's permissible for him, but it's going to be makru. Okay, it's permissible for, for him, but it's going to be makru. I'm saying there may be a situation where for this person, it's not only makru, it's haram. The situation is that in his town or village or city, for whatever reason, there's only 40 people upon whom Juma is obligatory upon. So all of the others, they may be slaves, they may be women, they may be travelers, right? And uh, Juma is not obligatory upon those people. And we said that even if they attend, they do not constitute the number of 40 which is required because the 40 that is required has to be those that Juma is obligatory upon. So this man that is traveling now before the Zawal, in a normal situation, it will be just makru upon him, just disliked. However, in this situation, it's going to be haram. Why? Because this person is the 40th person. Okay, so he's leaving behind him 39 people whom Juma is obligatory upon them. And so they cannot establish Salatul Juma without him. And he knows that. Okay, so in this situation, the ulama, they said that this person is going to be haram for him to travel because it means that the other 39 people, they won't be able to establish the Salatul Juma without him. And of course, this is in a situation where it's not an emergency upon the person and that he's compelled to travel. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If that which was correct, it was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The many mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge and good and to make what we do heavy in our scales of good deeds, to make us sincere, only doing this for his sake. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We'll stop here. This was the um, uh, section pertaining to the uh, uh, the wujub, the sharut al uh, wujub, the conditions of Juma being obligatory. Next week we'll start upon the section which pertains to the conditions of Juma being uh, valid, sharut uh, al of the validity of Juma. What are the conditions for Juma to be valid? Okay. If you have any questions, uh, then feel free, inshallah.